Hi everybody, I'm Megan West with My Faith Vote. So glad you can join us today. I am really excited about this conversation that we're gonna have with John Cooper. He is the lead singer, the bassist, the co-founder of the hugely successful American Christian rock band Skillet. He's also a husband, a dad, an author, a podcaster, but most importantly, he loves Jesus and he is not afraid to talk about biblical truth in the public square. So would you please welcome John Cooper. John, great to see you today. Thank you. It's so cool to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we're so excited. Now, I know there's going to be some in our audience that are like, what is My Faith Votes doing talking with this um, superstar rock guy? But at the <laughs> same time, um, on the flip side, we have posted a couple articles about you on our social media in the past few months, and they have gotten such an overwhelming response from our followers because I think they you've touched on a chord that they all relate to, and that is that you're speaking truth, biblical truth, into cultural issues, and they really appreciate that. So I'm really excited to talk to you because you're not afraid to do that. In fact, you've written a book about that, but talk about some of the things that you've spoken into recently, particularly um, the Grammy Awards recently, and just your courage to speak into that. Right. <laughs> I don't think I've talked about it in any, in the interviews yet. Yeah. That, that was a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think that one of the reason maybe people have responded to me well to me speaking originally, I didn't think anybody would care. I, th I thought people would be like, shut up. Why, why are you <laughs> saying anything? And, um, and I, I honestly for, uh, didn't want to at first because I thought, this is just not my lane. I'm not an academic person. There's lots of smart people that can do that. It was actually my wife that was, was prodding me. She was just like, you need to, to say something. You need to write something. You need to speak out, yada, yada. Uh, Cause she, she, I would always just, I'm always doing this to my wife. And she's <laughs> like, why aren't you saying these things? I'm like, cause nobody will care. I'm a dumb rock star. But I think that, uh, I think maybe what people like is the fact that you do have some very academic people saying things and you do have some pastors and 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 some uh people that are more like poli into politics with this other there aren't a lot of those like uh, we call them the boots on the ground folks mm -hmm. it's right. sort of like hollywood is for leftism you know with leftism you have your academics you have your politicians but for leftism you've also got like hollywoods you've got rock stars and normal people that just influence people and they say things in a down to earth way. And so maybe God has used me in that capacity. And if so, I'm really thrilled about it. The reason I talk about this stuff is because of all the people that I know personally, that they're feeling that chaos. They're feeling the constant chaos of what is happening. They're Christians. They're like, I know the Bible says this, but maybe I'm wrong because every day truth seems like it's changing. And, and I just want to say, no, 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 just calm down. Truth is not changing. The world is getting psycho. That's all that's happening. Mm. Truth isn't changing. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you, if you stick to that, if you build upon that, then you are going to have peace, even though the world is being thrown to and fro on every wave of doctrine, as, as it's, it says in the Bible. The Grammys was something that I wanted to say, not because, just because it was, it was a repulsive thing. Right. It, it is repulsive, but we've had lots of repulsive things in the Grammys. The difference was just to say this 20 years ago, obviously it was sex, drugs, rock and roll. It was just hedonism. It was let's celebrate a pursuit of pleasure. No one thought that at the end of that road, no one thought the end of that pursuit was virtue or, mm -hmm. or morality or a, a higher level of knowledge than we used to have. People just thought, yeah, they just want to pursue pleasure. And we know from the Bible that there is a passing pleasure of sin. Sin is fun for a little while until you realize how much death it's bringing into your life. The difference between now and then is that now that same pursuit of hedonism, it's almost like at the very end of it, you get to somehow be virtuous and you get to be the moral one. You have to, you get to be the, the one at the top of the tier that gets to tell everyone else what righteousness is. And that is, that's twisted. Now that's the difference between 
old school, what I would call paganism and this new sort of virtuous humanism almost. And I thought it was important to say for that specific reason. Right. Well, and calling out, you know, because we've become a culture that says evil is good and good is evil. Mm -hmm. And where are we going to stand for biblical truth? And at My Faith Votes, we talk about three core things, pray, think, act pray unceasingly. We've got to cover everything in prayer. We know the power of prayer. Think. We've got to be thinking biblically about the issues and then ultimately act. We've got to be acting out on our faith and living our faith in the public square. And I think that's what people really appreciate what you're doing. And what I appreciate, especially after reading your book, is you're not just some celebrity rocker who speaks into philosophies and the emotions. You really come at it from a deep, intellectual, truthful position. And you've you've thought out these things. And I, I really appreciate the deep level of thinking um, that you bring to the table. And, and so your book, it's called Awaken Alive to Truth, Finding Truth in the Chaos of a Relativistic World. What led you to write that book and speak to that in our culture at the moment? Well, thanks. That's so very kind. Uh, I think what led me to write it you know, probably back in 2012, my guess is that a lot of people <laughs> listening to this are going to be like, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. 2012, 13, that's when I started noticing the world is changing so much that I, I can't, I just can't quite keep up. I don't understand the things that I'm hearing. I, I know that, that when I hear these things on TV or even in some Christian circles, I, I knew that what they were saying meant something that I just didn't understand. And, and so I, I file that in my brain as a, huh, that's very strange because I've been a Christian since I was a kid. I've been in church since I was a kid. It's really weird to hear such new information, new language. What really struck me was when people I knew started using this same language. They were using these same words, and I knew that they had an intent that, that was like what I was hearing on the news or hearing on other social media sites, but they're people that I knew. And I guess what I'm getting at, it was the heartbreak into the story is this, it's the heartbreak of watching people that I grew up in the faith with, that I always thought we were going to be arm in arm for the kingdom of Christ all the way to the end of the race, you know, running the race and we're going all the way nonstop for Jesus and for his glory some of those same people to see them devolve from mm. their faith, deconstruct from their faith to such a degree that it can't be called Christianity any, any longer. People that I knew, my kids and their kids are friends, but the husband decided to have extramarital affairs, or maybe the couple together decided they would begin to have an open marriage or because, you know, God would never want to restrict us from loving <laughs> or whatever weird thing they're saying today. These were people that used to be orthodox, and now they're saying such weird stuff about Christianity. And so it hit me in a personal way. It wasn't just the fact that I was hearing all this stuff on the news. It's people that I know, people that I love, mm -hmm. and I see what happens to their kids. And uh, I just thought somebody needs to, on a normal level, meaning everyday language, explain what is going on. So short version, I know I've been talking for ages, but short version is this from 2012 to 2016, I read about 180 books wow. <laughs> because I did not understand what was going on. It was at the end of, of that, probably in 2016, I finished a book. I was in bed. I closed the book and I looked at my wife, of course, is right next to me. I looked right at her. I was like, I finally figured out what's going on. And I can't believe it took me four years to figure it out. We don't believe in truth anymore. Mm -hmm. I had studied postmodernism in college, but I never knew that anyone would actually like believe it. It's just, it's too silly to believe, but we now have a culture built on postmodernism, which is, is, is a horror show. Right. And, you know, we talk a lot at My Faith Votes about thinking from a biblical worldview. And we sometimes we get pushback of people saying, well, you can't relate faith and politics. They just can't mix. But we're now in a place where because there is such um, a growing movement of people stepping away from Christianity or saying they're not in, involved in any type of religion, there's no moral compass of God being our moral compass. And so 
they're turning to government to, you know, facilitate these issues and legislate these issues and things that are biblical truths like life and marriage and gender. And where do you see that falling into the, the church today? And because sometimes you're sitting in next to someone in the pews and you don't even know if they have the same biblical worldview as you. <laughs> and how did we get to that place? Yeah, that, it's really, it's really scary. Um, for, for, for anybody that's watching this young, like they don't understand it wasn't like this 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an entirely new, uh, for America, it's a, it's, it's an entirely new situation. I, I, this is why I, I'm, I'm, I really like what you do, uh, Megan, what you guys are doing. It is so important for Christians to understand the worldview, of course, but to understand a little bit of political science in that mm. I think that Christians naively, my, myself included, we naively thought that we could live in a pluralistic society and that everyone would kind of agree on what right and wrong is and what good and evil is. But the more you understand the Bible, the more you know that that's not actually true but, but because of, of the nature of man. And so I would encourage Christians who feel like, hey, we don't want to we don't want to get our religion involved in politics. I would encourage you to realize this. All politics is religious at some point. Mm -hmm. There will always be a God of the system. Whatever law people believe in, even if they say, no, I'm an atheist, but I just believe that there are just some things in the universe that we just know we that are like murder. We all know murder is wrong. It's just natural. Well, then I would say, OK, then natural law is your God. There's always going to be a God at the top. It's what you view as the most authoritative thing that you build laws on top of, right? right? So I guess what I would say to people is that in that sense, all politics will come down to something that you view that is the supreme lawgiver. And if we don't have that, we will be in moral anarchy, which is where we are going right now. That is the reason that as a Christian that I can say, I believe that it is wrong to kill a child in the womb. I believe it's murder. I believe it's wrong. But my next door neighbor can say, no, 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 that's actual reproductive justice. Hmm. So now we're, this is a great example. This is what we're in. The Christian says that that is murder. The humanist of today says, no, it's actually justice. That is a positive good in society. How is that going to be rectified? They are bringing their religion, if you will, of whatever that is, humanism or what have you. And now we have to realize that we can't live in that sort of pluralistic society. So we need to speak into, if Jesus is Lord, he's got to be Lord of everything. So he needs to be Lord of the ethical realm, of the right. civil realm, of the, the realm of laws. Right. And why do you think it's so difficult for Christians to be able to stand for biblical truth? Because part of the reason why My Faith Votes was even founded is we, we discovered that 25 million Christians who are registered to vote stay home during presidential elections. That's even worse during local and state elections. But it's not just in the political sphere as far as voting, but Christians are just, they're feeling afraid that they'll be silenced. Um, there's Christians who are losing their jobs because they're even stepping out into proclaiming truth. Why do you think it's so difficult for us to proclaim truth when that used to be pretty easy? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's probably complex on lots of levels. Maybe one tidbit that I'll throw in there. I mean, we have been so blessed. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to sound like a, a partisan hack, but we've been <laughs> really blessed to have grown up in a country founded on Judeo-Christian values. And I think that we have so taken it for granted that I think that that goes back to why a lot of Christians think that pluralism will work. I think they think it'll work because we are going to kind of agree on justice but the only reason they think we're all going to agree on it is because we've been raised in a culture built on Judeo-Christian law and, and ethics and, the, of course, the ethical words of Christ. That's the only reason. So 30 years ago, your garden variety atheist born in America still saw the world through a foundational Christian worldview. They still believe that there is inherent morality, inherent right and wrong 
whether they knew why they believed that or not, that's the system they grew up in. And so because I think the church hasn't done a, a I don't think we've done a very good job of, of teaching that sort of history, those, that sort of political science and that worldview. Because of that, I think Christians just kind of thought, we're all going to kind of agree on the same stuff. And I don't want to, I don't want to put my faith in America. And, and of course, John Cooper and Megan, we <laughs> don't want to put our faith in America either. Jesus Christ right. is the only hope for the world. And because of that, I think Christians have gone, well, I'll just not get involved because the worst that it will ever get will, in their minds will be a secular society built on Judeo-Christian values, mm -hmm. but that's not the worst that it can get. What the worst that it can get is a society that revolts against Judeo-Christian values, which is what we see now. And so now that's why it's becoming a little bit more clear that the Christian worldview is very different than I think what we are beginning to see now, which is uh, which I would call a competing religious worldview, even if it's atheistic. Right. Well, and I even heard you say it's it's a, like a cultural coup against Christianity, and and we're seeing that play out. And you wrote a blog post um, in 2019 that went viral, and it the title was "What in God's Name is Happening in Christianity?" And I think that speaks a little bit to this void of seeing culture progress into something far from biblical truth to what's even happening within the church. Speak mm -hmm. to that a little bit, because I, I even saw a news story this week of a prominent Christian who's renounced their faith. And I'm, I've, I've seen it happen with even close friends who have been Christians their whole lives. And then recently they're buying into the narrative that they don't need to live like that. And God isn't truth. Um, speak to that, that blog post you wrote and then kind of bridge the, the gap of what we're seeing in the culture today. Oh, it's so very sad. It's heartbreaking, mm -hmm. isn't it? I've it seen is. that in, in you know, my own life as well. Here's the thing. As we just said, America is not going to last forever. Our hope isn't in America. Our hope is in Christ. So, mm -hmm. so you know, there are things I do think that we will suffer if we don't if we don't understand what is good about America and and how blessed we have been in certain ways, then yeah, we'll suffer a little bit. But that is not anything, anything compared to how important it is that these relativistic worldviews that we're talking about, this idea that truth is it is it real and that good is evil and evil is good, when that comes into the church, which it has. That is what's dangerous, and that's mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm most passionate about. And I actually believe – we'll need to talk to somebody a lot smarter than me <laughs> to figure this out – but I actually believe that a lot of the church is being destroyed because of political agenda. I, I don't actually think it's the other way around. I think it's people being in the church being swept away by political agenda, and the 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 I would say they're – the political leftism – is beginning to make them theologically left, hmm. if you will. It's almost like progressivism politically is leading to progressivism theologically. And I think that's really scary for lots of reasons, which we won't talk about. But the reason I did write that post is watching that sort of progressive theology come into the church and, and begin changing things that I thought we had all kind of agreed on for the last five, 400 right. years. And they, this is stuff we, the church has held true for centuries and to see people come in and begin to, to act like you, know, the thing that really just annoys me is when they act like they're the first person in the whole world that's ever asked the question, you mm -hmm. know, somebody said, uh, how could a, how could a loving God ever allow someone to go to hell? Nobody, nobody asked the question. It's like, yeah, everybody asked that question for, thousands of years. Right. Um, that is not a new thought, but it, it's that sort of like new, it's this new social media arrogance. You know, you, there's all these things and we go, well, it's my platform. Nobody asks this. Yeah. Everybody asks that question. You can read lots of books about it. You might not believe it, but how have you been a Christian pastor for 20 years and never wrestled with God being right. a God of love and justice? It's kind of strange, kind of strange. Right. Yeah. And 
And you talk a little bit about that, and I think that speaks to the foundation of where we hold truth from a biblical worldview, because mm -hmm. you mentioned your first week in college and how um, your your philosophy, what, what you believed in was really tested because I assume you went to a secular college by the way that you were talking about it in the book, but speak to that first week and just the need to have a solid grounding in the Bible and um, maybe what we can be doing for our younger generations to encourage that. Sure. Yeah. I did talk about that in, in the book. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes me laugh just thinking about it, but yeah, basically, yeah. You know, going into college and all of a sudden, I mean, I'm trying to, I haven't talked about this in a while. So I'm trying to think, what do I say? What do I not say? I mean, I don't want to shock anybody and I'm, I'm not trying to be gross or anything, but the amount of of just free sex uh, available. And again, I'm not saying this to shock people. Let's just have a real talk. The right. amount of free sex available in college was just shocked me. I just didn't know. And I wrote about that in the book. I was, you know, raised in a Christian home. And, and obviously, I mean, I wasn't a total moron, but I was quite naive to what was going to happen when you got to college. So all of a sudden you're bombarded with this just sex, drugs, rock and roll. But day one of my classes, I had you know three different professors, day one, make fun of Christianity, just mock Christianity, but not even in any sort of pertinent way. You know, one of them was like an, just an orientation to the school and they just thought they would just take a little break to make fun of Christianity mm -hmm. and how some Neanderthals believe in stuff like that because they're too dumb to believe in science. You know, it was that kind of stuff. It, it just bombarded me the first three days of school. And so it was during that week that I was like, have I been lied to my whole life? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and nobody's ever prepared me for what was coming. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that sort of fight. And it was through reading my Bible because I, I'd already been a Christian, which uh, I won't tell the whole story, but I gave my life to Christ when I was a kid. And I always believed in God. I always knew that God was real. I always knew that, that Jesus was my savior ever since I was five years old. And I prayed that prayer, right? Yeah. So I, I knew that Christ was my savior, but I was like, but to what extent, maybe there's a good way to say it. To what extent will that matter when it comes mm -hmm. to biology, evolution, free sex, um, God's design for, for marriage and for sexuality and A, B, C, and D. To what extent does it actually matter? And it was during that first week of school of reading the word of God. It just hit me so hard. I, I, and I read this passage that says that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And it was for whatever reason, when I read that passage, it all came back to me all my Bible training as a kid Mm -hmm. that it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. So yeah, you can go to school with all these smart, intelligent professors, but they don't have what actually matters, and that is wisdom. So if there's anything I encourage, maybe especially young people or young believers or anybody watching that is wondering what truth is, I just would encourage you that the Word of God, the Bible, is the foundation for everything. Without the foundation of the word of God, nothing is going to last. But if you build on the foundation of the word of God, you will be unshakable because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. His word never changes. And I always want to tell people that if you're, if, you, if you're feeling that chaos and you're being thrown around, go back to the word of God. It, he will not fail. Amen. And you and I are both parents of teen year children. And, um, you know, that it's a challenge to raise kids in this culture and this society to ground them in the truth of scripture. So what what's some advice that you might give to parents watching who are raising kids and fighting the social media battle and, you know, the power of our phones in our hands, but to go back to biblical truth, just Give us some tips that you're using with your kids. <laughs> parenting <laughs> parenting <laughs> in the 2020s. Oh, oh, my gosh. No kidding. Oh, my gosh. My kids are, are a little older now. They're 18 and 15. And both of my kids are saved. Thank God. And both of my kids love, love Christ. 
I, I probably would give a few, maybe I'll give a few practical things. I don't know if this will help you, anybody or not. The theology, I, I call it a theology of lordship. I don't know if that's the best way to say mm-hmm. it, but we see that with the Puritans and you, you read about these great men and women of God and they set out to make Jesus Christ the Lord of every single aspect of their life. And I kind of alluded to it a second ago. In other words, in college, there's a part of me that said, I know that Jesus is Lord of my life in an eternal sense, okay, on salvation, but does he have to be the Lord of my life in my biology class? Do you see what I mean? In mm-hmm. other words, we we break these things up, don't we? I know mm-hmm. that I know I'm going to heaven, but does does he have to be the Lord of my life in terms of what? what I watch um, on YouTube, right? All right. Whether we're talking about pornography or whatever it is that, that people struggle with, does he have to be the Lord of my life sexually or in my marriage, in my children, in my finances? Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and he wants to be the Lord of every single aspect. And so with my parenting, I've always tried to, to make sure my kids understand. So if I'm teaching my son, I, I love doing carpentry. Uh, and so I, I teach my son how to do woodworking and I'm teaching him how to use the saw and I'm teaching him how to measure something and say, son, if you don't measure it right <laughs> and you begin to build a table, if you bake the foundation wrong, that table is not going to be flat. It's not going to be straight. Everything you do glorifies God because you're building a system in which your foundation is here and then you build the next piece and everything you do is built on Christian principle. And I've just always tried to make sure that my kids with their finances, with their friendships, with what they watch on TV, that they understand that there is a godly way to do it. There's nothing that that Christ doesn't speak to through his word. And so the challenge is this. I know a lot of Christian parents who would like for their kids to have that theology of lordship, but the parents don't actually live themselves Mm -hmm. in that theology of lordship. So I would encourage parents to know this. You'll never teach your kid to do something that you ain't doing. Right, they, right. They, they, can, they can sniff it a mile away. So I encourage them for that. And my second thing I would say, I'm a dad, so I'll talk to dads now. It's true for moms <laughs> too, by the way. But I will tell you men out there, your kids need to see you pray. They need to see you sing to Jesus Christ. Mm. They need to see you worship. They need to hear you talk about how wonderful it is to be a brand new person because of the work of Christ on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit. I I just have a real passion for my kids should see what it means for their dad to be under the lordship of Christ. So I want to encourage you dads, especially sing to Jesus in front of your kids. Mm, Amen. And it, it instills in them that biblical identity, which it seems kids today are struggling with so much because of the pressures of society. And I really appreciate that's great wisdom. Um, we may not be able to sing like you, the rocker, but um, <laughs> that might be a good thing, <laughs> Megan. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I love that. But, but John, just as we kind of close out our time, give people encouragement to be able to stand for faith in a bold way and be able to put faith in action. I mean, I, th- I think we're just hungry for that encouragement because we feel like we need to shrink back because we don't want to step out. But man, give us encouragement to be able to stand boldly for our faith. Sure, I would love to. You know, I think that there's, uh, and I, I'm assuming this is pertinent for a lot of people listening. I know a lot of Christians who love Christ. They do have a theology of lordship and yeah. they want to make a difference. What I find that they struggle with, this unique subset I'm talking about, is that they don't want to be mean. They, they don't want to sound like they're just mean to everybody. Like you have to do it my way, you know, like we talked about. There's so many hot button issues right now, right? Whether we, uh, abortion is probably the, the top of the list. People yeah. get really mad about abortion. They don't want to be mean. But I would encourage people in this, that Jesus is our standard, obviously. We know that Jesus was loving. Was there ever anybody on earth that was more loving than Christ? We obviously know, of course. But Jesus was not afraid to speak the truth. And in fact, I had a friend recently that was like, yeah, John, but 
he what did he say to me? He said, Yeah, but everywhere Jesus went, everybody wanted to be around him because he was amazing. And I just said, Hey, I just gotta tell you, I kind of gotta challenge that. People tried to kill Jesus all the time. They got so mad at him, they gnashed their teeth at him. They tried to push him off of a cliff. Yeah. People turned away. His own disciples turned away from him because they said, Wow, this is a hard what is it? This is a hard saying. And that's what they said to Christ, right? After yeah. he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is a hard saying. They left him. Jesus wasn't Mr. Nice Guy. Of course, he wasn't mean, but Jesus would say the truth when it needed to be said. And I think that we are in a time very different than the America of 10 years ago, of 20 years ago. We are in a time when I believe the most loving thing that we can do is to speak up and say what we know is true. Because every time we don't say what is true, the world is getting farther and farther away from truth. And the farther you get away from truth, the more you enter into pain. The truth of Christ is safety. Outside of the truth of Christ is when you actually get into pain, suffering, death, poverty. So... If, we, if we're so loving that we don't tell mm -hmm. people you're going towards death and pain, then are we re truly being loving? I don't think we are. So I would encourage people. I'm not saying to be mean. I'm not saying to jump on social media and start yelling at folks. But just to say in a loving way, hey, it is the most loving thing I can do to speak the truth to you. Jesus is the answer and he can set you free. And if you build your life on top of him, he will give you peace in the middle of all of this chaos. Amen. And and we can ask him for the words to say. We can ask for his wisdom. We've got the Holy Spirit living in us to give that that power and um, and just what we need when we need it. So, gosh, John, we super appreciate your insights and just your courage to stand boldly for Christ. Would you mind closing out our time in prayer just to pray for our nation, to pray for Christians across this country to be bold in their faith and give us opportunities to live for Christ in all aspects of our lives? Absolutely. I'd love to. And thank you so much for having me, Megan. Thanks, everybody, for watching. It's a real, uh, it's a privilege mm -hmm. to be here. So, yes, I will end us in prayer. Great. Oh, <clears throat> Lord Jesus, first of all, I want to thank you that we can call you Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you that you have called us and that you have loved us with such a great love that even though we would not have wanted to serve you, even though we would not have wanted anything to do with you, that you actually called us to be your own. And that is amazing Bible truth. So I'm so honored to call you my Lord today. I do want to pray for this uh this boldness that we're talking about, you know, I, when I think of the word boldness, Lord, I think of your word. I think of Stephen, the martyr. I think of the Holy Spirit. So filling Stephen and giving him the words to say that he, he had more wisdom than all of the, the learned people, all of the elites, all the religious elites were bested by Stephen because of the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I, I want us, I want to be just like that. I know so many people listening, they want to be like that too. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your presence, with your power, that the word of God would be so alive. And I pray that when we open our Bibles, that we would begin to see your truth. We would begin to understand more deeply your truth and that it would change our lives. And lastly, just because we talked about it, I want to pray for all these wonderful parents, people that are listening right now that have kids. I want to pray that we would fall so deeply in love with you, God, and in love with your word that we truly could say that we have a theology of lordship, that every aspect of our lives is being made holy unto you, and that our kids would see that holiness and see that passion and through the power of your spirit and your faithfulness that you would transform the lives of our kids who are growing up in such chaos and such unrighteousness and such a godless society, but that they would see the truth of your word and your wonderful design. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. John, thank you so much. 
So people can find you at johnlcooper.com. We'll put the links on the interview. The book is called Awake and Alive to Truth. Thank you for speaking into that. And I know people would really appreciate that book so they can find it on your website. And you've got a great podcast too. So I encourage people to, to join it. You've got the little logo right behind you, Cooper Stuff Podcast. Woo, there he is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> awesome. Well, John, we are praying for you, for your ministry, for your music as well. But thank you for being a bold witness for Christ in our culture. Well, thank you so much. Likewise, I had a great time. All right. Thanks, John. Have a great day. All right. <laughs>